you want as much dialogue as you can get. And there's Jim standing there waiting while they're setting it up. And he's looking at the script and he's, psh, Milberg can say this. Psh, and I will let Chester say this. And he's tearing, he doesn't want to speak. Welcome to A Word on Westerns. I am holding the Gunsmoke hat from Jim Arness, signed by Jim. On the inside of uh, the sweatband, I would open it up and show you, but the sweatband would fall apart in my hands, and I, I can't do that. And it almost fits me. Well, fits me pretty well. Pretty well, yeah. All right. I'll, so I'll wear this. I'll wear this with my special guest today, who all did Gunsmoke episodes. Sitting to my left, we have Jim Burns, who worked on Gunsmoke as a writer and a producer from the, the late 60s up until about 1973 or 74. Five. 75 when it ended. Then he later wrote and produced the first Gunsmoke movie and created How the West Was Won, the McCahans. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Over here we have from the first season of Gunsmoke, Brett Halsey. Or as a lot of people know him in Italy and Spain, Montgomery Ford. And he has uh, just written a book with a gorgeous cover by Bill Schenck, West of Hell, a fictional Wild West shoot 'em up novel. So uh, we're going to give this away? Okay, we won't. <laughs> That's the only one I have. That's a proof copy. Dude. Okay, <laughs> this is in the lending library of Brett Halsey, so you're going to have to yeah, touch base, over. Touch base with over. him. <laughs> and sitting next to Brett, we have Mr. Martin Cove, also from uh, a Gunsmoke episode. Welcome, and welcome all of you, and thank you for being uh, here as, as part of this show today because we are here to honor Gunsmoke, the longest running show. We don't even count Law & Order because it changes cast every seven or eight years, okay? So take that, Dick Wolf. And besides, they're doing 22 a year, and uh, they started with 39 episodes when you did your first episode. What was that like back then? It was an experience I'll never forget because I'm a fairly big guy. And I, well, this was 1956. I was a lot younger then. I played a, uh, a, a kid who was having problems, not a very nice kid. And Jim Arness was trying to, trying to help me and he was losing his patience. And finally in one scene, he, he loses his patience with me. And he reached out and he grabbed me by the front of my shirt and lifted me up like that. <laughs> And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> and it worked for the scene because it was supposed to impress me and it surely did. <laughs> but that was the interesting thing about in 56 when I did the show is the, uh, the town, the, the main street was on a stage. It wasn't outside at all. It but, looked like it too though. Well, <laughs> producer's studio it was called then. I think it's called Raleigh now across from Paramount. But that was something, the, the whole main street of this town was right there on the stage. It made it tough leaving town on a horse because they'd have to cut away to people waving uh, as they ran into the scrim in the back, I guess. And the horses would get lazy because they didn't have very far to go to get them. <laughs> well, uh, Marty, you did one of the color hour-long episodes and I think Paul Koslow and uh, the Big Lebowski was in that with you, right? Oh, well, David da Huddleston. Yeah, David, yeah, the big Lebowski. I never think of him as that, yeah. Oh, we played a terrible family who comes ac across um, Rance Howard and his wife, and we, you know, we, we shoot them all and kill them all, and then we're arrested. <laughs> it's a terrible family. And then we, David Huddleston is the father, and, you know, then we break out who was arrested, which was Paul Koslow. And, um, but, you know, one of the greatest stories I remember, I was in, ta I was in town all of a year. In 1974, and you do a gun smoke, and there was James Arness one day standing. And James Arness is standing, and you know, as a hungry actor, you're in town all of the year, and you want as much dialogue as you can get. And there's Jim standing there, waiting while they're setting it up, and he's looking at the script, and he's, Psh, Milberg can say this. <laughs> and I will let Chester say this. And he's tearing, he doesn't want to speak, you know? And Paul Coslow and I just sitting there, 
give us, we'll, we'll take the dialogue, you know, we'll take it. And he said, no, I can't. He pulls out the pages, tosses them on the ground. He says, I can't say this, you know, and then Kitty can say that, you know. And we, would, we were hysterical because he was so open about it. He says, I don't want to say this. It was kind of the last year of the show. And he said, I don't know, you know, he only does so much dialogue, you know. But we had a great time. There's a couple of stories that are very bawdy that we can't really talk about. But, you know, but he was just so much fun for a young actor to come to town and mm -hmm. do a gun smoke. Well, know. after the show was off the air for a few years, Jim, of course, did the McKay hands that, that Jim Burns created that uh, became How the West Was Won. How did the first Gunsmoke movie uh, come about. Whose idea was that? Well, my agent's idea, actually, because uh, I worked on Gunsmoke for seven years, and he said, "You ever make a Gunsmoke movie?" He told us that's to CBS. You ever make a movie? Jim Burns has got to write it, and uh, it happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wrote the first one, and I produced the third one. Mm -hmm. John Matley was sick, and so I took over. Mm -hmm. Well, well, so and John Matley had taken over. Uh, just about when the color episode started to come in. I think he had been uh, associate producer and then they made him producer. He was here long before me. Mm -hmm. I, I came as an assistant uh, story editor behind uh, Paul Savage. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I just, I just wrote for the show for two years. I was on staff and then I freelanced. But I always went back and did gun smokes and I ended up doing 37 of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. 37, I think. Huge. What sort of guidelines did they give you uh, for the characters as you were creating new stories? Well, the characters are pretty well established. I wrote mostly for the new the uh, guest stars mm -hmm. uh -huh. and created those guest stars. And I did Mr. Other Martin guys like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and the names uh, that that John Messon had used for all of the bad guys and uh, just all of the characters in the early episodes. You obviously were inspired by that because the names of your characters, and you wrote some of the best episodes. I remember Lobo with Morgan Woodward. I first uh, smoke. What a wonderful parallel between an aging lone wolf and an aging hunter. Well, how that happened, uh, they, John Manley told me, you, he read a script of mine, he says, we want you to do a gun smoke. The problem is they've been on for 13, 14 years, so every time I came in to pitch a story, I failed. He said, we did that one three years ago, we did that one five years ago, and then, and we're, or we don't want to do that one. So I finally, um, I finally started failing all the time, and so I finally researched, and I found this one story about a, about a wolf, a renegade wolf, and, and they put a bounty on him. I said, they haven't done that one. So I wrote an outline, and then I waited for everybody on the office to go to lunch. And then I walked in there and walked in and went to Matley's office. I dropped the outline on, the, on his desk and I left real quickly. About 3.30 that afternoon, John called me and said, we like this one, we want you to do it. So that was the start. And then when, then when Paul retired, they uh, brought me in to do the story editor. Wow, wow. So as uh, the story editor, would, would you hire the, the writers or were they already part of it and they'd submit? Four or five guys who did most of the scripts. Mm -hmm. and. I did the polishing, sometimes I do rewrites and stuff like that. Sometimes I was up until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning rewriting and shooting the next morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. how, often, how often did that happen in terms of, like, here's some fresh pages for today that you're shooting? It didn't happen often, but it did happen. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. well, you, when you wrote Walk a Texas Ranger, he wrote it as an episode, one episode. Uh, same casting movement, Pam Pellifroni, who cast Gunsmoke. And, um, it was one episode and we shoot it and we go down there with Chuck and everybody and they liked it so much they called two weeks later and made it a two-parter and he rewrote the whole thing to make it a two-parter to add and it was you know just off the cuff hey we got to do that yeah. you they know, sent me to Dallas they called me up and said come to Dallas and we have one hour we need another hour yeah out of the blue yeah. out of the blue yeah and is that with the flashbacks yeah, yeah, that's yeah. The flashback one. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. We go yeah. into contemporary times in the old west, mm -hmm. and, and he incorporated it. It was brilliant. Yeah, no, that was really one of the best episodes of Walker. Thank you. But uh, <laughs> that, that, that that reminds me, we did um, spaghetti westerns in Italy. They they would leave it to the actors to uh, to, to write this. One. <laughs> well, a lot of them, a lot of them look like that. You know, yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> With the Gunsmoke, because that was one of your early uh, roles, uh, 
how was it that you were you were cast in that early on in your career? You had done, I think, Highway Patrol and some other shows at that time. I had done quite a bit of work at that time, 56. I was under contract at Universal. I worked in 13 films there. Little parts, big parts. I was the... Ma and Pa Kettle. Ma and Pa Kettle. Yeah. I was the oldest son on Ma and Pa Kettle. I worked with Audie Murphy and To Hell and Back. Sure. One uh, of the great films, really. That was the highest grossing movie at uh, Universal that year. Audie was, was really nuts, <laughs> but a, a good friend. Mm -hmm. We had, I remember one episode, I'm quite a bit taller than Audie, and we were boxing in the gym one day and I accidentally kind of popped him in the nose. And he looked at me and it, it was like, I felt like a thermometer. There's a red just coming up. <laughs> and I put my hands down and I said, that's it, Audie, this fight's over, and I turned my back. <laughs> And then he, he relaxed, he laughed, but uh, that was Audie, man. You get him started and he, 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 if he had to kill this whole room, he'd do it. Mm. He, he was just, once you hit that trigger, because working on the picture, to see the things that he did, I'd read the book and, and, and I knew what he had done, but to watch it, even as an actor watching another actor, I was in awe of him. You know, like he'd take one machine gun and wipe out six, German machine gun Ness all by himself. One scene we were shooting, he, he's on this burning uh, ammunition carrier. It's on fire. He gets up with, their, with a machine gun and stops a tank attack mm. by himself. Yeah. Well, you, you said that uh, you became friends with him uh, in addition to working with him. How did he relax? How did he unwind with all that pressure? You didn't see the pressure unless you hit the switch. Uh, no, he was he was he was relaxed. I mean, it was always un, it was always there. But but he re, he was a good friend. He was good to be with. He, he liked to laugh. Mm -hmm. Audie was a good guy, good cowboy. Gunsmoke uh, for me is the the best series that television has ever produced because it's so consistent. Usually a, a series will run, if it's successful, for five or six years and then everybody wants to go off and do something else. But there was something about the main characters in Gunsmoke where they knew these characters, they knew they were in a, a high quality show and they stayed with it for 20 years. And you gentlemen, in addition to all of the other crews and the guest stars and the people that have been on it, have helped make it lasting. And so I know it's uh, especially for you, Marty, coming into to LA just as it was ending, to be able to get a role on Gunsmoke must have been a dream come true. And I, I kind of wonder where, I think Gunnar Hellstrom was the director of that one. And, and um, I'm not sure if you wrote that one, it was called In Performance of Duty. But I remember going in there and just cackling and, hey, God damn, you know, go really wild. And I just did it because I figured it was gun smoke. And you can just go for it as an actor, you know? And, and it's kind of bizarre. I never did a reading like that. And I was only in town like a year, not even. And um, it was accepted and they liked it. And you felt, just like everybody else said tonight, you felt so at home there. Well, he was a pretty good actor, too, Gunnar Hellstrom. That's true. Uh, yeah, he did act, didn't he? He was a Swedish yeah. actor, I think, you know. I, I worked German, yeah, yeah. No, no, he was, he was Scandinavian. Yeah, Scandinavian yeah. fellow, yeah. Yeah, I worked with him in a picture at Fox, I don't remember which one now. But he liked the crazy stuff. He liked going out there and, you know, everybody being, you know, an exaggerated Bruce Dern. You know, he loved it. <laughs> How do you exaggerate yeah. Bruce Dern? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, that give me an idea what he liked. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, we like having you all here, and I want to thank everybody for coming, and we hope we see you in January. Thank you all. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Thanks for watching A Word on Westerns. Each week we post a new episode, and all you have to do is subscribe right here. Click on this. You won't miss a one. Adios.